Hey, Cheyenne East. If you're watching this, you are interested in learning more about the capitalism critique, specifically what it is, what's capitalism, and what are the best strategies to beat it. So this video will be a pretty in-depth discussion of all of those topics. If you've stumbled into this and have no idea what a critique is, check out our video on critiques. But let's get started. So first, the basics. At a very high level, capitalism and another subject we're going to talk about in today's video, neoliberalism, are economic philosophies. They are a way of figuring out who should own the various means of production within an economy, uh, who should have the right to produce certain goods and services, and then how those goods and services are distributed. So let's start with a very basic definition. Capitalism is an economic system in which private individuals or businesses own capital goods. The production of goods and services is based on supply and demand in the general market. You may have heard that called a market economy rather than through central planning known as a planned economy or a command economy. And we'll talk about the differences between those in just a second. You've likely heard capitalism referred to as free market economics or laissez-faire economics. Uh, in those particular circumstances, private individuals are unrestrained in making economic decisions. They may determine where to invest, what to produce or sell, and at what prices to exchange goods and services. There are no checks or controls. We'll, we will talk about in a second about whether the pure form of capitalism I just talked about even exists. But let's break that definition down a little bit more. Functionally, capitalism is one process by which the problems of economic production and resource distribution could be resolved. Instead of planning economic decisions through centralized or political methods, i.e. the government, planning under capitalism occurs via a decentralized and voluntary decision. You are likely familiar with the term the private sector. That is what capitalism is all about. So a few big takeaways from that basic definition. Capitalism is an economic system characterized by private ownership, private ownership of the means of production, particularly in the industrial sector. Capitalism depends upon the enforcement of private property rights, because if individuals in the private sector are going to own the means of production, then their right of ownership in those means of production has to be protected. That provides the incentive for people to invest in and produce uh, goods and services and productive use of capital. Uh, with that all being said, let me let me pause here and give you what you're seeing on the screen, the key markers of capitalism. How do I know if what I'm debating about or talking about involves capitalism? Well, first, private ownership is important. Property rights is important. But then another thing that is incredibly important is the notion of profit and losses. If you are in business in a capitalist environment, the goal of that business is to make a profit. And typically that is some kind of fiat currency like dollars or euros or yen. Pick your currency. And the idea is you want to maximize that profit and you want to avoid losses, losing that money. And that desire for profit in a capitalist system tends to drive things like innovation and competition in order to determine what's the best price point, providing a superior good or service so that people will want to buy those. Now, capital goods, this is a important uh, concept of capitalism. Uh, capital goods are essentially the means of production. That is the inputs that go into making, say, a car. You need steel, aluminum, you need the electronic components, you need rubber for the tires. So amassing, distributing, and using those capital goods efficiently is a hallmark of capitalism. Now, with that in mind, let's talk about neoliberalism. 
which is a little bit different than capitalism, but they are related. And the reason we're going to talk about them both is very often critiques in this regard will talk about neoliberal capitalism or they will critique neoliberalism uh, for many of the same reasons that they would critique capitalism. So you need to understand what they both are. So neoliberalism is a little bit different than capitalism because it is a largely political philosophy. It takes the concepts we just talked about with capitalism and applies them to try to resolve political problems using free market concepts, the notion of supply and demand, uh, private property rights, the competitive environment of the private sector to resolve things like health care or education that is typically left to the government. So what is our definition? Typically, neoliberalism refers to an economic system in which the free market is extended to every part of our public and personal worlds. It's generally associated with things like cutting trade tariffs and barriers, a, a purely economic issue, but it has also influenced the liberalization of the international movement of capital. Foreign direct investment is an example of that, and limited the power of trade unions. Uh, it encompasses both politics and economics and seeks to transfer the control of economic factors from the public sector, that's the government, to the private sector. Uh, this has included decreasing government spending, decreasing government regulation, decreasing government ownership of various industries or enterprises. And few big picture takeaways. Uh, neoliberalism from a policy standpoint often materializes in things like fiscal austerity, so less spending, deregulation, free trade, privatization. Uh, their globalization is also one of the typical takeaways from neoliberalism as well. Um, now, we just talked about those. Those are the big key, key the slide says markets, but it should be markers. Apologize for that typo. But in any event, you should hopefully understand kind of a high level of what's going on. All right, let's talk about some practical issues now that we have a basic understanding of capitalism and neoliberalism. Uh, the first practical issue that you should understand, and this is all important background to debating the critique, is the concept of crony capitalism. Crony capitalism is the idea that we don't really have true capitalism, that there is a version of capitalism where we have a free market economy, but the private sector uses its political influence to get the government to craft laws or regulations that work in their favor. So it is not truly a free market economy at that point. It is one in which certain powerful brokers within the economy are able to also leverage the public sector to gain an advantage in the private sector. So that, that does happen. That America has that and a lot of other uh, countries that we would think of capitalists would have that as well. Now with that said, there's no true version of capitalism that exists in the world today. There's no economy that is solely based upon free market economics. Countries like the United States, who are often held up as the hallmark of capitalism, are in fact not really capitalist. Maybe we're 60% if we wanted to say something like that. There is a lot of regulation on various industries. The United States government owns several components uh, of the economy, owns uh, public utilities, for example. There are lots of places where the free market is not truly free and that supply and demand aren't the true drivers of how capital is spent in the economy. So that brings us to the question of capitalism versus socialism and capitalism versus communism, because you need to understand the difference if you're going to debate the critique and understand the evidence that the other side is reading against you. So we've talked about what capitalism is. We're not going to do that. Socialism is the concept that the government is much more heavily involved in determining the direction of the economy. And there is a dramatic increase in government spending 
in a world of a socialized economy. You can look to Europe as a good example of where socialism has taken root. And in those, in the European countries, particularly Western Europe, there's a great deal of control by the government. They influence, they get to set limits, they get to help set prices. There is a lot of intervention in the economy. And as a result, there tends to be higher taxes because you need to be able to fund the government's ability to do that. And then communism. Communism is sort of the opposite pendulum of capitalism. In a communist economy, the central authority, or typically the government, controls the economic means of production. There is no private sector. The government owns everything and distributes goods and services as it sees fit, not necessarily as private individuals would see fit. All right. With that background, let's actually get in and talk about the critique. As you know, there's three parts to the critique, and we're going to break each of them down. Now, on the link level of the critique, there are a few basic link arguments that a capitalism K will use. The first and most obvious is if there is an advantage, the affirmative claims about improving the United States economy. As I mentioned before, the United States is capitalist, even if we're not a pure capitalist system. So any argument by the affirmative that they would strengthen a capitalist economy would be an argument that links you to why capitalism might be bad, because you are perpetuating capitalism. On a more generic level, critique teams will also argue that the use of the economy in general, uh, either to strengthen it, to use economic motivators as a perhaps a solvency mechanism for the affirmative, are all instances of propping up capitalism. Another example, deregulation. And this is an example of where neoliberalism comes into the mix for the critique. If your affirmative is deregulating something, you're reducing burdens or barriers within the law, that's an example of neoliberalism and can be based upon the principles of capitalism, as we discussed a bit ago. So that could also be a link to the critique. Now, there are lots of different versions of capitalism critiques out there. As a result, there are lots of different link arguments that could be out there. But these are the most straightforward. Now, we're going to talk about how to defeat those in just a second, but it's important that you understand how those link arguments typically get derived. Now, let's talk about impacts. Impacts are big, scary things, and capitalism tries to claim them all. The capitalism critique will argue that capitalism leads to things like war, environmental destruction, consumption slash dehumanization. So let me walk you through the typical scenarios for how a capitalism critique will argue these things happen. War. Capitalism critiques tend to argue that capitalism, because it is competitive, concerned with money and resources, creates things like resource competition. And resource competition, scarcity of goods and services, can lead to conflict as the countries that require those resources compete and ultimately fight to obtain them. And frankly, there are real-world examples that could support this claim. I'll give you one. In World War II, one of the largest drivers for the Japanese to attack the United States was because the United States had cut off Japan's supply to critical supplies, not only for its war effort, but it's for its economy, things like rubber and oil, which are used in the manufacture of military equipment, but also civilian equipment as well. And that provided an impetus for the Japanese to attack the United States. So this scenario does have some historical roots and historical proof. But again, the notion that there are worldwide conflicts present day because of capitalism really isn't true. The next one, consumption slash, de slash dehumanization, is really an argument that the sort of supply and demand, the idea of growing your business, making more money, consuming goods, consuming capital goods to make other goods, leads to a view that the owners of a business – 
look down upon and dehumanize the labor force who helps make those goods or provide those services. And as a result, the drive for money within a capitalist society causes us to devalue our fellow human beings. And there, there's all sorts of philosophical impact arguments for why that would be bad. There's also uh, some impact cards about how that may contribute to conflict, poverty, uh, genocide, other, other sort of uh, death-related impacts. Finally, and this is in a similar vein, is the environmental destruction impacts. Capitalism, because it produces goods and services in a true form, an unregulated form, requires the producer of goods, typically, to consume natural resources. And that can be cutting down trees to make paper, it can be drilling for oil and natural gas, mining for metals, and that typically will require some destruction of the environment. And so these impact arguments are that unchecked capitalism or increasing capitalism increases the drive for resources which destroys the environment. And then you've got philosophical arguments for why that's bad and real-world arguments, things like climate change, uh, species loss, biodiversity. There's a, there's a whole host of those. But again, it's all driven by the need to consume resources. Finally, let's talk about alternatives that you might hear with capitalism. I've listed four here. There are, of course, any number that a team may choose that these are typically the ones that you will see. First is an alternative that's based around creating some kind of new economic system. I've listed communism, so I'm going to deal with that separately. These new economic systems typically are undefined in the alternative. It's just we are going to rethink and create something better than capitalism. They tend to be fuzzy and a little bit vague. There's the classic reject the affirmative or reject instances of capitalism, and we'll talk about how to deal with those in just a second. Finally, or excuse me, third, anarchy uh, is one in which the capitalism critique argues that there should be sort of violent revolution, anarchy to overthrow the system. And then finally, uh, this is a little bit different than the rethink to a new economy, is embracing a specific alternate economic philosophy like communism. All right, with that groundwork laid, let's talk about 2AC strategies. How do I deal with the capitalism critique? I've listed six general arguments that you can use. Our files are going to have more specific ones than this. There are also way more than this out here, but if you are just trying to figure out where do I start, this is your primer. The first and really the most important argument for most any critique is the permutation. There are two general permutations that I'm going to talk about. The first is your typical do both. Argue that the affirmative plan and the alternative, whatever that is, can happen at the same time. That will help you deal with most of the rethink, embrace something new. The only one it won't help you with is the reject, because you can't reject the affirmative and do the affirmative at the same time. So the second bullet that's here on the screen is what helps you resolve that argument. You can say, reject 99% of capitalism, except the instance of the affirmative. That's a legitimate permutation because it's all of the affirmative and less than all of the alternative. Totally legitimate theoretical from a theoretical standpoint. So why would you do that? You do that because by doing that permutation, you are able to argue to the judge that the only way that the negative team can prove that you don't vote for the permutation is if they can read specific evidence that the reason that capitalism is going to cause bad things is the affirmative because the permutation rejects everything but the affirmative. So all other instances of capitalism theoretically would go away. So the negative then needs to prove that, well, no, actually, if you still leave the affirmative, you cause all the bad things from capitalism. And that requires a very specific type of evidence that, frankly, I don't think critique teams have in uh, most instances. 
So that groundwork laid, let me let me talk real quickly about one other critical component to arguing a permutation. And this is true for every critique. It's not enough to say do both or do the plan and reject 99% or whatever your permutation is. You have to make arguments as to why the permutation solves the impact of the a critique better than just the alternative. Because you can even think of it as sort of a best policy option issue. You need to be able to prove to the judge that the alternative by itself is insufficient. You have to include the affirmative, i.e. the permutation, for everything to really come together, and that will resolve both the impact of the affirmative and the impact of the critique. That is how you weaponize, if you will, the permutation and make it offense. Second argument you can make, capitalism good. You can impact turn or sort of turn the thesis of the critique. Their principal argument is capitalism causes bad things. You can take the position that capitalism results in good things. And there's a lot of evidence and a lot of arguments out there. The innovation in the medical sector, uh, for example, has created vaccines that are used to, say, fight the coronavirus. There are developments in food and security and infrastructure and a whole host of other industries that have improved our quality of life. Uh, there, it's, it's not proven, it's more uh, correlated, but the introduction of capitalism as an economic system correlated with massive improvements in the quality of human life and lengthening human life compared to what it was before capitalism. Next argument is our utopianism argument. You can argue and should argue that the idea of pretending that rethinking or embracing or uh, endorsing a new pedagogy, whatever critique terminology the alternative uses, will translate into real change absent the use of the federal government or another governmental actor to change the law is utopian thinking, and you can apply that argument. And if you need an explainer on that, uh, go check out the utopianism file. It's got a great one-pager that explains how that argument works. Fourth, you can argue and should argue that the transition away from capitalism to whatever the alternative suggests we should create will be violent, will be destructive, and that's very likely true. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of businesses, there are a lot of powerful people in the world who depend upon the economic system as it exists. And they stand to lose a great deal in a world where we're trying to forcibly transition away from that economic system. So they would probably fight to preserve it. They would probably try to destroy, put down, silence the people who theoretically would be uh, enacting the alternative to the critique. And that is that is a dual argument for the affirmative because you can use it to show that the alternative wouldn't solve. But you can also argue it as a disad to the alternative, that by embracing whatever it is that the negative wants to do, you actually create more violence in the world. Next, you can argue that you just can't eliminate capitalism. The notion that we are going to just shift away and become communist, for example, uh, has never worked in the real world. Uh, there have been countries that have absolutely tried it. Uh, Russia and China, or I should say the former Soviet Union and China, are both great examples. At one point in time, they purported to be communist, but over time, capitalism crept back in. And although China continues to hold itself out as communist, it has much more of a free market economy today than, say, it did 30, 40 years ago. Finally, and we've already touched on this a little bit, you can argue that the alternative economic system or economic philosophies that will be implemented are worse. Uh, for example, communism uh, was attempted in, so in the former Soviet Union and in China, and it was terrible for the economies and the people within those countries. The standard of living was lower, poverty was astronomical, uh, you had food shortages, you had famine, you had violence, you had political suppression that are all tied to that. Uh, and you can argue that those provide historical examples for why the alternative would be worse. So you can sort of turn the alternative uh, 
as a negative, as a, a bad option uh, if you endorse the negative. We have evidence to support these claims, along, along as, like I said, with, with many other different arguments, but these are always available to you when you are attacking and hopefully beating the capitalism critique. Now, let me close with this thought. This is, even though I've been talking for a long time, and if you've stuck in here till the end, good for you, uh, this is still just a high level. There's a lot more to capitalism, there's a lot more to neoliberalism, and there's a lot more to these critiques. You need to read. You need to understand capitalism. If you're in an economics class, you're going to get a great understanding of that. Uh, but there's a lot of very easy-to-read books about this, a lot easier than reading some of the critique literature, and I would encourage you to read those. <laughs>